Hello, my name is Colin Hanlon, and today we will be learning about the phylum Platy helminthes. But to assist me in my demonstrations today, I want to introduce my assistant, Patrick. Patrick will be helping me with some of the examples, and uh, he will do a little explanation as well. First off, Platy helminthes are also known as flatworms, and there are over 25,000 known species of them. They range in size from almost microscopic to over 20 meters long, and the longest ever recorded flatworm was a tapeworm that was over 90 feet. Most of these organisms are parasitic, and they obtain their energy from the carbs, amino acids, and fatty acids of their host cells. These organisms can be divided into four categories, the Turbellaria, Monogenia, Trematoda, and Cestoidea. These organisms do not have a fluid-filled internal body cavity, but instead have a relative solid body mass. Flatworms are the simplest animals that are bilaterally symmetrical and tripoblastic. Tripoblastic means the organisms are composed of three fundamental cell layers. Bilateral means the organisms are capable of division into symmetrical halves with identical parts on each side. The lack of a cavity constrains flatworms to be flat. The cavity is without specialized circulatory or respiratory organs, which restricts them to flatten shapes that allow oxygen and nutrients to pass through the flat bodies by diffusion. The organism's cells are made up of three layers, an ectoderm, an outer covering, an endoderm, of the digestive system, and a mesoderm. Mesoderm allow tissues to organize into organs and even connect into organ systems, so flatworms are much more complex. The organisms also have a nervous system and a ganglia that acts as a tiny brain. However, one structure that flatworms lack is an anus. The same opening both takes in food and expels waste. Flatworms contain several advancements in body structure over the simple radial phyla that came before them. They have structured sensory organs, and a few even have light sensing organs. And they also have nervous tissues at one end of their body, which gives them a distinct head and tail. Very little is known of their evolutionary history because they have very soft bodies, which do not preserve well as fossils. Scientists originally believed that the first Turbellarians evolved around 550 million years ago. These organisms are native to sea and freshwater. Flatworms breathe through their whole body surface, and this makes them vulnerable to fluid loss. So the organisms prefer to live in environments where dehydration is unlikely. Common types of habitats include moist terrestrial environments, such as leaf litter, or between grains of soil. Let's explore the four divisions of organisms. First is Turbellaria. There are over 4,500 species of Turbellaria. This class of flatworms is unlike the others because it consists predominantly of non-parasitic organisms. They are carnivorous predators, and the most famous example is planarians. Recently, the genome of planarians was sequenced, and it was estimated to contain over 20,000 genes. Planarians are also famous because they are used as a model for stem cell biology and regeneration. They are a model system for cancer research because they can regulate stem cells and signal abnormal tumor growth. For Turbellaria, cephalization occurs in the form of eye spots and paired ganglia, as well as an actual nervous system. This means the eyes are positioned to perceive new surroundings as the organism moves into new areas. All Turbellaria are hermaphrodites, so they have both male and female reproductive cells, and they fertilize their eggs internally by sexual intercourse. Turbellaria have adapted to a wide range of environments. For example, many species of Turbellaria are able to thrive in the almost uninhibitable depths of the sea. Thank you, Patrick. Now please let me explain the class Monogenea. In this class, the organisms are external parasites that infest aquatic animals. The larvae of Monogenea metamorphose into adults after attaching to a suitable host. One unique adaptation to Monogenea is the opus haptor, which is responsible for attaching the Monogenea to their hosts. Many flatworms utilize specific adaptations to host environments. The scolex which is the head of certain flatworms, is highly specialized and can only attach to the gut of fish with a complementary structure. The next classification of flatworms is Trematoda, which are also known as flukes. There are over 11,000 species and they are all parasitic. Examples of this classification include the many species of blood flukes and liver flukes. The Trematoda are distinguished by their very complex life cycles. The mature stages live as parasites in the digestive systems of fish and land vertebrates, and the intermediate stages infest secondary hosts. Please let me do the next one. 
Cystoidea is the next classification, and its most famous member is tapeworms. These organisms are parasitic, and the mature stages live as parasites in the digestive system of fish or land vertebrates, while the intermediate stages infest secondary hosts. There are also facultative anaerobes that derive most of their energy from glycolysis. They depend on glycogen stores to store their energy for when they are not receiving sufficient nutrients from their host. One very good example of a cestoid is a tapeworm. As adults, tapeworms attach via a specialized head to the lining of their host's intestines, and they lengthen by adding proglottids, which are segments whose entire purpose is sexual reproduction. Many people associate tapeworms with disease, but that is not true. In fact, adult tapeworms rarely cause problems for the host. The problem arises when the larval forms use the body as an intermediate stage for growth and reproduction. Life cycle of flatworms varies, but for the most part, the organisms produce gametes and reproduce sexually as hermaphrodites. Generally, flatworms have numerous testes, but only one or two ovaries. Schistosoma is an example of a flatworm with a unique life cycle because it involves multiple symbioses. First, the male and the female blood flukes sexually reproduce. This sexual reproduction occurs inside a vertebrate, such as a human. Then, larvae emerge as parasites on a secondary host, like a snail. Afterwards, the flukes reproduce sexually within the snails. The larvae then emerge to infect yet another vertebrate host as adults. Talking about schistosoma is a good transition to talking about flatworms and disease. Schistosomiasis is caused by one genus of trematodes and is the second most devastating of all human diseases caused by parasites, behind only malaria. People that work in or around freshwater contaminated with human feces are at risk for contracting schistosoma. Another example of flatworm disease is neurocystic ercosis, which arises from the larvae of pork tapeworm. It is the major cause of acquired epilepsy worldwide. The threat of flatworm parasites to humans in developed countries is rising because of organic farming. Rock. Scientists have been able to use flatworms for biological pest control. In, in the Philippines, Indonesia, Hawaii, New Guinea, and Guam, two planarian species have been used successfully to control population of the imported giant African snail, which was displacing the native snails. However, scientists are now worried that these planarians may themselves become a serious threat to the native snails. Also, in Northwest Europe, there are concerns about the spread of a New Zealand planarian which preys on earthworms. This has a major effect on the country's agriculture because it is taking a toll on the natural food chain, and it is also causing scientists to spend a lot of money on finding a solution for the pests. Other tapeworms have a considerable economic impact on countries because they often affect sheep and fish farms. The flatworms are known to use sheep and fish as hosts, and they can cause widespread disease throughout the farms. Thank you very much for listening. Hopefully you learned a little bit about flatworms today. Before we ask if there are any questions, let me tell you our interesting fact. Some of the larger aquatic species mate by penis fencing, which is a duel in which each species tries to impregnate the other, and the loser adopts the female role of developing the eggs.